Hi there and welcome. Jonathan here. These talks are offered freely so that no one is ever denied access to these practices. Your support makes a big difference. If you feel inspired to make a donation, please go to jonathanfaust.com. Thank you. We had a little glitch in the recording matrix last night during the talk, so this is me here in my little home studio the next morning giving this talk on transforming your relationship with fear. So it will be without the wild applause, hilarious laughter, and foot stomping during the particularly hilarious parts of this talk, as well as the the sense of odd reverberating silence around the depth of the... uh, meditations that I lead. So you have to bear with me here. But I'd like to start off with a story. One summer night during a severe thunderstorm, a mother was tucking her small son into bed. She was about to turn the light off when he asked in a trembling voice, Mommy, will you stay with me all night? Smiling, the mother gave him a warm, reassuring hug and said tenderly, I can't, dear. I have to sleep in Daddy's room. A long silence followed. At last, it was broken by a shaky voice saying, The big sissy. Three weeks ago, before the election, I gave a talk entitled, How to Keep Your Heart Open During the Election. I had this talk planned, but I had no idea how prescient the title would be, which is Transforming Your Relationship with Fear. There's certainly a lot of it right now, and I'm not diving into politics in this talk, but I do want to talk about fear and how you can work with it. So this talk is comprised into four parts. First, I'd like to make a distinction between healthy fear and unhealthy fear. The second, to explore the source of fear and how it shows up. The third, some strategies for how you can shift your relationship with fear. And finally, to talk a little bit about what does it mean to live with, with healthy fear as you go about your life. So a little bit about healthy fear and unhealthy fear. I've always thought there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who need to fully prepare before they're ready to do something, and there are those who just jump in. I was always inspired by the Peace Corps. I think In our Quaker meeting when I was a kid, I must have been maybe 11 or 12 years old, there were some people from our meeting who were giving a presentation after coming back from Kenya. And I just thought to myself, that is something I want to do one day. That just looks amazing. So when I was in college with an English major and getting my master's, I talked with a Peace Corps recruiter and I mentioned my degree and what I was hoping to do, and asked if there was any interest. And he kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, you know, you know, we're, we're kind of set up pretty well with, uh, with teachers right now. Is there anything else that you've done? And I said, well, I, I've managed a 500-head livestock operation, a hog operation, all through college, you know, and grew up on a farm. And he said, that's what we're looking for. We need people in animal husbandry, people who need to work with... Uh, who know how to work with animals. So um, I listened and I thought, well, let me uh, think about that. And I ended up accepting a job teaching in New Mexico. And after the end of that year, I thought, you know, maybe I should revisit this Peace Corps thing. So I went down to the recruiter down in uh, Albuquerque and I said, hey, I had this background of working with animals. I managed a 500 head livestock operation and uh, grew up on a farm and wondering if there might be of any, any interest in that. And he said, well, you know, not so much. Um, anything else that you've done? And I said, well, you know, I got my degree in English and I have my master's. And he said, that's exactly what we're looking for. And he kind of looked through his book and he said, so um, could you teach phonetics? And instantly I said, sure. Now, I took a course in the history of English language where I learned how to write my name in the International Phonetic Alphabet. That was pretty much it, but I wanted to go. 
So off I went. And I realized when I was doing my training at the uh, and preparing for teaching in the University of Niamey in Niger, French West Africa, that I was going to be teaching graduate level phonetics. That the people in the university were teachers who would be teaching out uh, en brousse, you know, teaching out in, in the bush. Then they'd come back, they'd get to do a year, kind of go back out and teach and come back. So many of my students were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And many of them already spoke about six different languages, which is how you kind of get by in West Africa. Very, very sophisticated. And I was really freaked out. I was in way over my head. I remember at one point someone said, Mr. Faust, could you explain the difference between a voiced bilabial plosive and an unvoiced bilabial plosive? And I said, that's a very good question, very perceptive question. And we're a little bit ahead of where we are in the curriculum, so uh, we will address that. And then I went back to my office and I thought, what the hell is an unvoiced bilabial plosive? And and I learned. Um, two weeks later, I could say, now would be a good time to talk about the, the voiced and unvoiced bilabial plosive and how it relates to the interdental fricative and all that stuff. I might have benefited from a little bit of healthy fear. I did learn pretty quickly all about phonetics and how to teach phonetics, but it was a little bit uh, a little bit wild for me. So there is this distinction of how how fear is there to serve us, and it's interesting to reflect what what type are you? Are you someone who just jumps in and makes it up as you go? Or are you someone who needs to feel like you're fully prepared before you take something on? A friend of mine told me how he did a men's retreat, and there was this huge debate between the five-day packers and the two-day packers. The five-day packers are the ones who bring everything they need, just in case. And the two-day packers are the ones who just take it and go. So, of course, the two-day packers were saying, you got to be spontaneous. And the five-day packers were saying, yeah, and you're the jerks who are always borrowing stuff from us. But fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Fear of looking like an idiot incentivized me to prepare this talk rather than just show up and wing it. And fear really, in its highest form, is clear discernment. It's the discernment that helps you make the choices that are going to move you toward what you most want in the world. And learning how to look at fear clearly can be very, very helpful because it's always two sides of a coin. My fear of snakes makes me a little jumpy when I'm out on the river on my boat and I come to some rocks because that's where they tend to hang out. But it also means I probably won't get bitten by a copperhead by petting it. So there are lots of antidotes about how to work with fear. But essentially, it's about the intention to get familiar with it. So let's take a look at how fear shows up and take a look at the the underbelly of fear here. So I'd like to tell you a little story about fear. And I'm going to call the main character of the story Michael Potts because that's his real name. Michael and I went to college together. Fusion to keep going. And right away, he had to lay off 20% of his employees. He had to deal with his investors, deal with staff. And he told me what it was like for him, that he only slept about two hours a night for a very, very long period. He could not stop ruminating about it. And there was this cycle of of fear and shame and terror and feeling out of control, of judging himself for being incompetent, just this incessant churning and burning that he was going through. And then I, I asked him, well, how did it shift? He thought about it for a little bit and he said, you know, is when I realized that there was nothing I could do that I just had to write it out. That was the beginning of the shift. And he did write it out. He ended up getting through that. In fact, I was with him when the money came through, and I think I lost some hearing in my right ear. 
uh, due to his enthusiastic response to that. And he's gone on to do other great things after selling his, selling the company eventually. But about that shift, and it really brings us back to the two fundamental questions that make up mindfulness. The first question, what is happening right now? What's the truth? Not your story, not your embellishment, not your preference, but what's happening right now? And for him, it was the recognition, there's nothing I can do about this. The second question is, can I be with it? Or, or how can I be with it? And what he realized was he just had to write it through. So that recognition, there's nothing I can do about this, and I just have to write it through, was his shift in transforming his relationship with fear. Not that it went away, but he was able to be more resourceful in relationship to that fear, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But you know that feeling of total dread? That gut-wrenching feeling like something terrible has gone wrong? Well, there are some interesting sources of fear. And this is not so much from Buddhist psychology, but there are three strains of fear that, that I have found helpful in my own investigation. The first has to do around survival. It has to do with losing your physical life, losing your well-being, or even losing your identity. The second has to do with control. It's the fear of losing control and the, the, the chaos and the aftermath of that. The third has to do with love and connection. It's, it's losing affection, attention, and love. And so for Michael, all of that hit him all at once. Survival. His, his livelihood. Seven kids staking everything on the success of this company, and it was possibly going to be wiped out. Control. He was the CEO of this company and managing very, very complex relationships with his board, with his investors, with all the people in his organization who had signed up to work with him. And there was nothing he could do. He might lose the entire thing. And then love and connectedness, his, his social status as, um, as someone who was making it happen, someone who was an up-and-comer, his relationship with these very sharp people on his board, the people who were really giving themselves to his vision to better themselves. All of that was completely on display. All of that came crashing down at the same time. So when we live in fear, you could say that there, there are kind of three levels of fear. And one would just sort of be the normal state of alertness. Just when you're driving, you know, you're driving down the road and on some level you're thinking, don't die, don't die, don't die. You know, look out for that truck. Here's a stop sign. It's about navigating your, through, your way through life and kind of preserving your, uh, uh, your body and your life. The next level would be more prolonged anxiety or fear. And when there's not a break in fear, then there's a chronic sense of hypervigilance. You're just scanning and ready for something catastrophic to happen. And there sometimes I feel like sort of like a low-grade fever. I've got low-grade fear going on, waiting for something to happen. The third level is really about the level of trauma, where, where the fear is locked in. And that's where you find yourself in a chronic state of fight, flight, or freeze. In, in fight, anger, aversion, aggression, judgment, blame, flight, some form of dis- disassociation, uh, inability to focus, lost in planning and fantasy, just lost in a mental hamster wheel. And, and freeze, which is just locking up inside, having no capacity to respond with any skill to what's happening. And the interesting thing is how all of this becomes more evident in your meditation practice. The more you slow down and pay attention, the more you will begin to see the natural state of, of the frozen places inside of you. 
the places inside that just disassociate when the going gets tough. The places inside that move into aversion, anger, judgment, blame. You begin to see it all. And getting familiar with those patterns can not only be helpful, they can be dramatically liberating. So whenever you feel fear, you tighten up. And this reading I found to be really helpful. One of the most majestic of all creatures is the tiger. For many years, these big, beautiful creatures have puzzled researchers because it seems that when the tigers hunt, they have a remarkable capacity for causing their prey to paralyze with fear, a capacity greater than any other of the big cats. As the tiger charges towards its hapless prey, it lets out a spine-chilling roar, and you'd think that this would be enough to cause the prey to turn and run for its life, but instead it often freezes and soon becomes tiger food. At the turn of the century, scientists at the Fauna Communication Research Institute in North Carolina discovered why you're likely to freeze on the spot rather than run when a tiger charges. When the tiger roars, it lets out sound waves that are audible, the ones that sound terrifying. And it also lets out a sound at a frequency so low you can't hear it, but you can feel it. And so, as the tiger emerges from the undergrowth, the flashing of colors, the sound of its roar, and the impact of the unheard but felt sound waves combine to provide an all-out assault on your senses. The effect is that you are momentarily paralyzed. So even though there may be time to avoid the tiger, you are tricked into standing still long enough for the tiger to leap on you. And our fears often operate in the same way. They paralyze us into inactivity, even when the real threat is not immediately upon us. And part of overcoming the challenges before us is to recognize the ability for our fear of what might happen to stop us from dealing with a challenge. Isn't that amazing that here are these sound waves you can't hear but you can feel and that is enough for you to pause and freeze and become tiger food so that mode that we go into when we're under a threat can mean the loss of life can mean the loss of responding to what's around us For many years when I was living in the ashram, I had a real fascination with diet and consciousness. And I was very much impressed with how what I ate affected how I felt and thought and so forth. So out of my rabid enthusiasm, I became macrobiotic. And basically the the macrobiotic diet is... Uh, eating things only in season, within a 40-mile radius, uh, without any pesticides, etc., etc., etc. And there's a very powerful uh, element to that. You, you end up very, very clean. But I got a little bit carried away. So I was macro-psychotic for about four years, and then macro-neurotic for about two or three years more. And then I was a full-blown macro-psychotic for <laughs> about a year. And I noticed that I became more and more afraid of food outside this narrow bandwidth of what I thought at that time was pure. And I became tighter and I became more judgmental of people who weren't eating the pure way. And I became very judgmental of the community because I felt that the community wasn't offering the most pure food that it could. So I had a meeting with uh, a very wise administrator in the ashram. And I kind of laid it all out. And he asked me just one question. Absolutely brilliant. Long pause. And he asked me this question. What do happy people eat? And I thought about that for a while. And then I said, 
okay, I got it. We don't need to talk any longer. It was so helpful. He helped me make a big shift from fear to being able to look at my fear. So let's talk a little bit about how we react to stress. One reaction is going into threat mode. And when you are under threat, you look for a simple strategy that will work. You look for a simple formula and you bet everything on that formula and you repel any self-questioning or any kind of learning. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to question myself. And you give yourself to that fully. Now, that is a way of self-preservation. You're kind of turning off the prefrontal cortex and you're going into survival mode. Now, it's not easy. I'm sorry, it's not difficult to sense how across our culture in recent weeks, that there is a large part of the population that responds enthusiastically to very, very simple solutions to our, to our woes. And sort of these bumper sticker slogans are very, very appealing and they give themselves to it fully. There is not any self-questioning about that particular strategy. And we all do it when we're under threat. But something happens when you can shift from threat mode to opportunity mode. When you are in opportunity mode, instead of thinking about survival, you have more of a capacity for long-term thinking. There's less of a rush And there's more about viewing the process as a process of discovery. As my friend Michael was saying, you open a restaurant and you see what people eat. You see what people like and you make adjustments along the way. You kind of look for a a natural kind of resonance as you move forward. So perhaps you can see kind of the alternating current of kind of threat and opportunity. That when you're under threat the amygdala in the brain is is hyperactive and you get caught in a chronic loop of stimulation and fear. It's oftentimes described as a limbic hijack. And regarding my macro psychotic uh, episode, I was in that loop. The fear simply created more fear. And I kept looking for simple solutions that were going to solve all my problems. And what helped me shift out of that was that question, would I rather be right or would I rather be happy? And what do happy people eat? Suddenly that managed to activate my prefrontal cortex a little bit. I could think outside the box of my finite mind. So learning how to recognize when you're caught in fear, when you're caught in that threat mode or the limbic hijack, just seeing the fear is the beginning of making that shift. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some strategies for working with fear. I did a little Google research and I discovered um, the top 10 world fears, according to somebody. (laughs) Public speaking, of course, is a big one. Of course, there's fear of death. When some comic observed that at a funeral, many, many people then would rather be in the box than giving the eulogy. But other world fears, spiders, snakes, heights, crowded spaces, dogs, thunder and lightning, small spaces, germs, flying, and one I had never heard of before, trypophobia, which is the fear of holes. Figure that one out. So how do we shift our relationship with fear? And here's something that the Dalai Lama said in response to that question. And I'd like to just to, to read you his response and then, and then maybe break it down a little bit. He said the following. Regarding fear, there are quite a number of methods. The first is to think about actions and their effects. Usually when something bad happens, we say, oh, very unlucky. And when something good happens, we say, oh, very lucky. Actually, these two words, lucky and unlucky, are insufficient. There must be some reason. 
because of a reason, a certain time became lucky or unlucky, but usually we did not go beyond lucky or unlucky. The reason, according to Buddhist explanation, is our past karma or our past actions. One way to work with deep fears is to think that the fear comes a result of your own actions in the past. Further, if you have a fear of some pain or suffering, you should examine whether there is anything you can do about it. If you can, there is no need to worry about it. If you cannot do anything, then there is also no need to worry. Another technique to investigate is who is becoming afraid? Examine the nature of yourself. Where is this I? Who is this I? What is the nature of I? Is there an I beside my physical body and my consciousness? This may help. Also, someone who is engaging in the bodhisattva practices seeks to take other suffering onto himself or herself. When you have fear, you can think, others have fear similar to this. Even though you're opening yourself to greater suffering, taking greater suffering to yourself, your fear lessens. So there's a lot in there. And just to kind of break this down and reiterate a little bit. So one is to reflect on karma, reflect on past actions, to consider that what you are experiencing is some way connected to actions from the past. Another one is to ask yourself if there's anything you can do about this fear. And if you can, then you can do that and lessen your worry. And if you can't, well, then worry and fear really don't have much point. A very powerful process, which he alluded to here, which is quite sophisticated, is to ask yourself, well, well, who is this self that's afraid? Where is this I that is feeling fear? And that can create a very powerful shift in identity. And yet another quality is to consider others who also feel this pain. And I find that to be quite helpful as well. When I'm in fear, I can ask myself, are there others that feel this fear as well? And that sometimes open up, opens up the frame a little bit bigger and makes it easier to be with my own fear. So there are many, many different strategies on, on how to work with fear. And uh, in the next talk, I'm going to dive into some of the real kind of tried and true fundamental strategies that you'll be able to try on. But fear is oftentimes referred to with this little acronym, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And it's very, very helpful for us to look at what we are afraid of and to see whether it is true or whether it is simply false evidence. And of course, when it comes to the experience of fear, We have incredibly sophisticated systems for distracting ourselves from really feeling and acknowledging that fear. And you could say that the greatest fear of all is the fear of your own death. And that speaks directly to this sense of self and self-protection and the verb selfing sometimes is referred to in this practice that, that when you're selfing, you are, you are investing into who you are as a separate identity. And when the body goes, then what? Huge fear around that. And that is why the early tantric practitioners oftentimes took up residence meditating in graveyards so they could look closely at this phenomena that's waiting there for all of us. And there are some incredible stories of, of many famous and not so famous uh, yogis who made a commitment to look very, very closely in the charnel grounds at the, the burning of corpses, to look at the reality that this body is going to fall away. And many of them report that that by truly looking deeply and intimately at the experience and the reality of death, that that actually began to dispel 
the deepest fears that they carried about life. When you know that your body is imbued with impermanence, that everything you hold dear in this life is going to fall away at some time, it can change the frame of fear quite a bit. So we speak actively and often of an acronym called RAIN, R-A-I-N. The R is to recognize clearly what is here, what is presenting. And again, it's not your story, it's not the embellishment, it's not your preference, it's recognizing what's true. So when you experience fear, to name it and look at it clearly. The A of this acronym is to accept or allow. It is very important, particularly when it comes to examining fear, that there are times when your fear may be too much. You may be flooded with fear. When you experience trauma, it is the blend of both fear and helplessness. And it may not be wise if it doesn't feel safe to hang out with that fear. Another time when the conditions are different, when you have more energy, more mindfulness, maybe in a facilitated session, maybe that would be most appropriate. So if it doesn't feel safe, let it know you see it and let it know another time when the conditions are different, you might be with it more fully. But if you do have a sense that you can be with fear when it arises, sense if you can allow it, if you can accept it. And just that question sometimes helps to open up the frame a little bit bigger. And this leads to the I part of this acronym, which is to, to investigate the fear, to be intimate with it. And primarily, we're exploring the experience in the body. There are other investigations of fear in terms of beliefs and thoughts, which can be very helpful, which um, I'll guide you through next week. But it's very, very helpful to look at the arising of fear in the body and then using the end part of this acronym to nourish it, to nourish it with empathy, with compassion, with kindness, and notice how it might move or shift or change. So if you like, we're going to move toward the close of this talk with a guided reflection on exploring fear. And it might be helpful as you select something to investigate, maybe not to choose that lifelong issue you've been struggling with forever and ever and ever, but to scale it back a little bit. So if you like, you can close your eyes and you might begin to deepen your breath and take a little bit of time to reflect on some issue in your life where you feel some fear where you feel some kind of clench inside. And when you have a sense of that, you might explore the recognizing. Kind of bring it close. Look at it closely. If you're visual, you might imagine a, a moving scene like a videotape or maybe a still image. You might turn up the colors or the brightness a little bit so you can really see the situation. It might be helpful to bring in some auditory information, any words or tone of voice or sounds that you associate with this particular image or scene. And you might now begin to explore the kinesthetic. When you think about this particular issue, where do you feel it on the inside? How does your body hold this memory? And as you recognize this issue, you might ask if it feels okay, if it feels safe to be with it. Can you allow it? Can you accept it right now? And if not, just put it to the side select another issue, or just let your eyes open. But if you have a sense that you can be with it, let yourself begin to explore the investigation, the intimacy, 
and I'll offer just a few questions and give you a little bit of time to explore. When you think about this issue, what does it feel like inside? If you were to describe this feeling of fear, how would you describe it to another person? Is there a sense this fear in some way is connected with your survival? Is there an element here of feeling loss of control? Is there something here about the fear of losing attention, affection, and love? Are there some emotional words that describe or modify this feeling inside? And as you sense holding this experience of fear, or it may have shifted in some way, you might explore this quality of nourishing. If you were to hold this in some kind of loving presence, to offer it some empathy or kindness or compassion, how does that move or shift or change? Is there a sense of how this fear or this felt sense of the body Is there a sense of what it needs or how it wants it to be, how it wants you to be with it right now? And you might reflect on the fact that other people feel this too that you are not alone. And you might, in your own way, wish yourself well. Reflecting on this final question, regarding the situation, what advice do you have to give yourself? And if you were to follow that advice, not perfectly, not all the time, what would that feel like? What would that be like? And letting this all just fall away. You might, when you're ready, let your eyes open and Just notice anything that may have shifted. So when you feel fear, you automatically move into threat mode. There is a clenching inside, a tightening, a kind of withdrawal. When you can recognize fear, when you can allow it, when you can be with it, when you can begin to nourish it with empathy and kindness and compassion, you may find yourself shifting into opportunity mode, beginning to see possibilities where they didn't exist before. And while there are many antidotes to fear, perhaps the greatest antidote of all is love, the power of compassion and kindness and empathy, remembering that you are not alone. We will continue our exploration of fear in a future talk, exploring other strategies on how to work with fear when it arises. 
but can be quite helpful to remember that this acronym of RAIN is so fundamental, recognizing it, asking if you can be with it, and to be with it intimately and to call on this quality of compassion and empathy. And when you see others who are in fear, to actively wish them well. A few quick announcements before we close. There's a spirit ceremony happening at the church, which you can find more information in the back. I'm offering a day long on December 3rd, which is called the Inquiry Intensive, the questions that can heal and set you free. And you can find more information on my website, and it'll be on the mailing list. And if you don't come, well, you may not heal and you may never get free, but that's your choice. And thank you, as always, for your generous support for the class and for the church. And may you and your fear have a wonderful evening together. And I look forward to seeing you again soon.